Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here. I know that you all have very busy schedules. And the lectures start usually at 1 o'clock, but um, we're very happy that you're here. We're also very happy and uh, honored to have with us uh, Dr. Caroline uh, Caroline is uh, a very good friend of mine, and we go back to many years when I initially started working uh, for the Ember region in the International Agency uh, of, uh, for Prevention of Blindness. Uh, Caroline is heading the Sightsaver uh, Foundation, one of the strongest NGOs globally in the area of prevention of blindness. Uh, she's going to talk about her activity and the activity of sight savers and the role of ophthalmologists and uh, optometrists and I have uh, personnel in the uh, fight against uh, blindness globally and also the role of WHO and so on. But today she's here to tell us about herself, uh, how she uh, sees uh, leaders, what a leader should be. She will give us some of her own experience of what she went through, how she uh, managed uh, the so many obstacles that she uh, came by during her career. Uh, Caroline is a great negotiator, a very strong opinionated lady. <laughs> you cannot break her at all. 99.9% .9 she gets what she wants. So I think it is, uh, it's going to be a very interesting presentation and something for us to learn on how to be strong and efficient in what we believe and in pushing forward the agenda and, and the points and the, the targets that we think will, will benefit everyone. I won't waste much time on, on this, Caroline. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Aziz. First of all, thank you very, very much uh, for inviting me here uh, to your hospital, KKESH. In Riyadh, it's, it's really lovely to be here, and I was so impressed by the hospital. Um, I did a tour of it yesterday, it's so huge and so modern and so impressive. So that was wonderful to see. I'm going to give two lectures today. This first one, as, as you said, is about uh, leadership. And uh, my goodness, leaders have been tested, haven't they, over the last couple of years? And I think that's not going to get any easier either. And uh, then the second presentation I'll give will be about uh, prevention of blindness. The role of ophthalmologists and other eye health personnel and sight savers, and what, what do we actually do? How do NGOs work with ophthalmologists? So, to start, um, we, how did I end up here uh, today? Well, like many women, I was very influenced by my father. So, when I was young, he basically said to me, Science is best, science is what you should do. Uh, you don't want to be studying these art subjects. Science is what will get you a good job, that's what you should do. So I dutifully studied maths and physics and chemistry, and then I did a physics degree, and I thought it was okay, I enjoyed it, but I didn't really want to go into the world of work at that stage. I went for a few interviews and found the jobs really rather dull. So I thought, well, I'm going to stay, I'm going to do more work here, and I did a PhD. I have to say, probably, looking back, I should have done a PhD later in my career when I was a little bit more grown up. And some of this was actually about not really wanting to grow up. But I loved my PhD. It was in energy research. Uh, it was based in Cambridge. And I learned things like how to punt on the river. And so you know, it wasn't entirely wasted. And it also then led me into a career in the oil industry, in the energy industry. Now, that has been a hugely useful foundation for everything ever since. <coughs> now, you might find that a bit surprising. How does working in the oil industry and energy lead you into an NGO and give you a great grounding for working in development and in ICAP. Well, it gives you the basics of commercial negotiation. Uh, it also helps you manage difficult people. A lot of people in the oil industry are difficult. And then also people in the NGO world are also difficult, perhaps in a slightly different way. Uh, but they are all opinionated. It's not just me. It's not just disease. Lots of people feel really strongly about what they do. And they're always right but they don't always agree. So there's often a lot of challenge. And I learned that working in the oil industry and legal contracts as well. That's terribly important for what I do. And this is a really useful grounding. But my first real test, I think, of leadership came uh, when I was offered a very big promotion. This was to lead um, a part of the oil industry of a company called Hess Corporation, 
that was moving downstream. And they asked me to set this up from scratch and run a whole division. And I was 37 years old. I spoke to my father and I said, this is a fabulous opportunity, what do you think? He said, don't be ridiculous. You couldn't possibly do something as huge as that. No way could you take on that. You'll just fail. That could be awful. And I was actually about to turn it down. But then he died quite suddenly, right in the middle of that decision-making process. And it was a tragedy, but it also gave me a big shake-up. What, what does it matter if I do fail? And if I don't try, well, I certainly won't ever know, and I certainly will fail. So I decided that, yes, I was going to give this a go. And so I took this job, and that really was an important beginning for me. We grew that part of the business and sold it on for £120 million, pounds, so from nothing to £120 million in about a decade. And it taught me such a lot about managing people, about what drives and motivates them, and also the difficult situation when we came to sell our business, where the market had simply collapsed. There was actually no profit to be made. It was not possible. Every firm of gas that you sold, you made a loss on. So the more successful you were, the more money you lost. The only way out was to sell the business. And at that point in my life, it felt like I was almost selling one of my children because I had grown it from nothing. But learning to face up to that, to make the most of it, was very important. And some of the team who worked with me through that difficult time are now in Sight Savers today. So we do have a small group of oil industry professionals near the top of Sight Savers, which perhaps is one of the reasons why we're quite business-like and professional. And for a couple of years, I did consultancy work. I ran my own business, helping other organisations. And I have to say, although I made quite a bit of money, which was nice, it really wasn't for me. I'm the sort of person who likes to get in and do things. I like to be the leader. I like to make the decisions. In consultancy, you're advising other people about what to do. You're trying to help them make the decisions. But then you have to walk away and let them get on with it. And I just found that very frustrating. It just wasn't me. So what am I going to do next? And I went on what was perhaps a very late gap year. So I was 44 years old, and I travelled around the world to a number of low-income countries, I went to Latin America, parts of Africa, went to China. And I thought, I don't want to go back and work for a private company where the whole driver is profit for shareholders. I want to do something where I feel that my efforts really mean something to people. And I would like to work, if I can, in some form of international development. And then Sight Savers just happened to advertise for a new CEO. And I looked at that and I thought, that's the job I've always, always wanted. I have quite a lot of vision impairment in my family. I am minus 10 myopia, and that was discovered at the age of six in a school screening. And if I hadn't been discovered, I probably would not be where I am because my mother just thought I was stupid and naughty, didn't realize I couldn't see anything. Uh, my father was blinded by diabetic retinopathy, and my uncle had an adverse reaction to drugs where both his retinas detached and he was totally blind from the age of 50. So I had some personal resonance for this role, and I went in for the interview thinking, well, I'm not sure why they would employ me. I have no experience in international development, or even in the charity world. Why would they employ this person with experience in the oil industry who hasn't even worked internationally? So I thought, well, the only possible thing I can do is be memorable. I must be very loud, so I went into this interview dressed in bright blue Chinese silk with enormous earrings and I was so full of enthusiasm and I did at least understand all their finances and told them where it was all falling apart. And two thirds of the trustees of the charity fell in love with me and one third said, oh my God, we don't want that woman anywhere near us. Fortunately, it was that way round. And that's when I joined Sightsavers and that was 17 years ago. And uh, basically, it's like coming home. I can't really imagine working anywhere else. And I just absolutely love it. I love the people I've met, the things we've been able to do. And, you know, you have some days you have an opportunity to sit with a women's group in Bangladesh and see how they're struggling with their blindness and, and how they have tried to make their lives work. Other days you can be shaking hands with the president. So the variety is huge. 
And then you get to do unbelievably fabulous things. So here, you see me on the stage of TED. And um, this was pre-lockdown. You can see my hair was rather shorter there. And what you have in my hand is um, a dose pole, which is what you use when you're distributing drugs for onchocerciasis uh, in Africa. And I'm talking about the possibility of eliminating trachoma across the world. And behind me, what you can see there, is a picture of a tomb, the wall of a tomb in Sudan, in El Khuri. And we found this, myself and my traveling companion, we went in a tiny little tomb in Sudan, and on the wall we found two pictures, a picture of an eye, and the eye is actually crying, and next to the eye some tweezers. So this actually shows you the extent that we had trachoma back then. And so what this was one of those fabulous examples of winning against all the odds. So we applied for something called the Audacious Prize, where if you win, these philanthropists will give you up to $100 million for your cause. And when we applied, we were one of sort of several hundred. And I said to our chaps, well, you know, well done for applying. We're going to get nowhere, obviously. And then we got to the top 50, and then the top 20, and now I'm starting to get excited. And then we finally got to the top 10, and I had to go record a whole speech uh, at the TED Studios that was beamed to a group of philanthropists on Necker Island, which is where Richard Branson lives. And this included some of the richest billionaires in the world. And then they peppered me with questions. That was the most scary interview ever. And then I got a phone call from Richard Branson a couple, about a week later. And uh, I was sitting in my friend's garden and he said, yes, we're going to give you $50 million. And then that increased $85 million when the Gates Foundation came in and over $100 million when the British government said, we'll join in. I mean, that's one of those moments in your life where you just cannot quite believe what's really happened. It was transformational. And as a result, we've done a massive amount of trachoma work in Africa, which I'll talk a little bit more about this afternoon. But through that career, and also through those 17 years in Sightsavers, I've learned an enormous amount about leadership, particularly leadership in very difficult times. Now, the first thing I would say is that the characteristics I'm going to talk about apply all the time. So it's not that you need something different in turbulent times, but I think certain aspects of leadership are more important and uh, really need to be emphasised when things are really rough. But the first thing I've learned, and this was something that was my instinct, but was also underlined for me by a real hero of mine in the eye care prevention of blindness world who sadly passed some years ago, a man called Brian Holden. And we agreed that actually the most important thing that a CEO does, a leader generally does, is to get the best possible people around them. Now, some leaders, especially, especially ones who have been inexperienced, can be intimidated. Well, if I get these really good people around me, what if they're better than me? What if they show me up? What if they take my job? That's a big mistake. Actually, if the people around you are better than you, they're going to deliver fantastic things, and actually that will make you look good. So I've certainly learned that you definitely want the best people, and then you need to support them. So frankly, publicly, if anything goes wrong, it's my fault, and if anything goes well, it's their responsibility. And you support them every inch of the way, and you let them fly. Don't try and control them and micromanage them and second-guess them because you won't get the best out of them and actually after a while they'll just get frustrated and leave. So you have to let them get on with it. That said, if you're finding it's not working out, you have to be brave and you have to agree to part. And one of the things I learned is that leaders, and certainly I, used to prevaricate. Let's put that horribly difficult decision off for a few days or for months or for years. Maybe they'll get better. Maybe it'll be all right. And I won't have to have that horrible conversation. But I've certainly learned that if you do that, everyone around you suffers. It's much better. You can tell, particularly at the senior level, if it's not going to work. Make the decision quick. Get rid of that person respectfully, but take that decision. So then the second thing that I've learned, and this one is very much a case of uh, during difficult times, you have to do even more of it. And that's about communication. And you can never, ever do enough. 
And sometimes you think, I must be boring everybody to tears. I've said this so many times in so many ways. Surely they're fed up of hearing it. But actually, it's not the case. You need to keep talking to people, communicating in as many different ways as you can. And one of the things that I did during the uh, COVID pandemic, which I'm still doing, is every single week I record a video for staff. It's not very long, you know, it's about 10 minutes long, and it just says, what's happened in the last week? What have I been doing in the last week? Maybe comment if there's been some really significant thing happening in the world, and just check in with them every single week, and they can see your face and hear your voice. And what I also learned is that you have to be authentic when you're making these communications. You have to show emotion and be human. And initially, I was always taught, well, leaders have to be terribly strong and tough, you know, so that people can look up to you as a strong leader, you know, nothing phases you, nothing upsets you. That's not right, actually, I found. People want to know that, you know, you share their concerns, that you're a human being. So one of the things I decided to do was I would share wherever I possibly could any bad news so that wouldn't be hidden. Because that way, people will trust the good news because they know that they're seeing both sides of the coin. And when we had some upsetting things happen, um, we lost a huge contract when the British government decided to cut its development budget. Overnight, they told us they were going to terminate our contract, and we lost £38 million, which is an awful lot of money. And that made me extremely angry that my country had walked away from a contract and broken its word. You know, the word of a, of a British gentleman used to be something that's not anymore. And this made me very angry. And I showed that on my video. I was not afraid to tell them how angry I was or to share how upset I was when we nearly lost a few people in Uttar Pradesh when there was huge shortages of oxygen during the big phase of COVID and Delta. And I think that's so important that people can connect with you in that way. Then I learned you have to understand your business. <laughs> If you don't understand your business as a CEO, you get in terrible trouble. And one of the most important things as the leader of a business is to know the financials. Often CEOs don't bother with that. I've got a chief finance officer. He does all that. I don't need to worry about that. But you really, really do. Because otherwise, you can get into serious trouble. And I've seen that happen with other NGOs. But that said, you don't need to get into the minutiae detail. You know, and areas where you're not an expert. So I have ophthalmologists who work for me. I wouldn't presume to tell them, you know, how they should be designing their quality standards that they're producing for the hospitals. All I need to know is they're comprehensive, they fit with the WHO guidelines, and that they're understandable. But it is really important when you talk to donors that you do know your business and that you have seen on the ground the programmes that you're talking about. And then risk management, this is another one. In these really difficult times, it's very tempting to just pull back into yourself. It's all very scary out there, and I don't want to do anything. But if you don't take risks, if you're not bold, you're going to miss opportunities. And working in the countries where we do, it's innately risky. You know, if you're going to work in somewhere like Mali or Nigeria, or even South Sudan, you're gonna to need to face up to security issues. But what you do need to understand is where are my risks and what can I do to protect myself? And most importantly, what are the things that would kill my organisation? And actually, I think there are two or three that you have to absolutely be aware of. Number one is cash. And often NGOs will just look at a profit and loss. I've got this much income coming in this year, this much expenditure going out this year, I'll be fine. But all the expenses at the beginning of the year and all the money's coming in at the end of the year and you haven't got the cash in the bank to pay your staff, pay your partners, pay your rent. And there have been a number of NGOs who have actually gone bust. Health NGOs, people like Merlin, who ended up just disappearing because they didn't monitor that properly. And remember, particularly have a very big contract, often the donor will pay you on results. So where's the money coming from to deliver the results? We had to take out quite a big bank loan with the DFID contract to make sure we could do that. The second thing that can kill you, I think, is poor quality. And that, because it feeds into two things. One is 
If you, for example, have serious endothelitis issues in a, in a hospital, no one will want to go back there. And that will get out to all of the people, potential patients, and the reputation for delivery good service will plummet, and the reputation then for eye care will plummet, and people won't want to seek services, not to mention coverage in the media. And then the other piece around reputation is making sure, generally, that you keep things safe. We may have all seen the Oxfam problems. The whole NGO can die in the eyes of the public if you aren't careful around safeguarding, whether that be around attacks, physical attacks, road safety attacks, and indeed sexual exploitation, which we don't like to talk about, but clearly has happened. So reputational risk can kill your organisation. Then I've also learned it's very easy to focus inwardly all the time, and NGOs are terrible at this. I've been in a meeting during a really difficult period of time, we went all around the table, every CEO, what is your priority? Well, I'm doing a strategy review. I'm doing a governance review. Oh, I'm doing a structure review. I'm really looking at, um, you know, my HR setup. This was all of their top priorities. But actually, you need to be focused externally. What's going on in the world? What do your stakeholders think? What do you need to do? And try, yes, obviously, you do need to think about your own strategy. But if you obsess about yourselves to the exclusion of what's going on outside, you won't be sat at the you won't work. And then being decisive. I think this is underrated sometimes in NGOs. People think consensus is what matters, but consensus can take a very, very long time. By the time you then come to that decision, the moment has passed and the opportunity is gone. And often the structures of NGOs make that extremely difficult. And they have very complicated arrangements, federal structures. Nobody really knows who's responsible for decision making. Everybody's too busy trying to fight the turf. And you end up not making decisions. So for me, at the moment, agility, short decision making lines, being bold are very important. And then sometimes it's better to make a wrong decision than to make no decision at all. I have to tell you, governments are probably the worst at this. Making a decision is often a terrible idea for them. And then the last concept I'd just like to share, this debate between collaboration and competition. We need to do both. Now, collaboration in our sector is absolutely vital. You know, we're tackling a problem that's far too big for any one organisation. We need to work together to do that. And there are many ways in which we do that. But I've also learned that you can't eliminate competition altogether. It's a driving force for people. It excites people. You know, we won this contract and not that organisation. We were voted the best hospital. That's brilliant news. And also, there's nothing that unites a group more than having a common enemy. But you have to be very careful in managing that competition because it can become very divisive if you're not careful. So one of the challenges for leaders is how to harness that competitive instinct that drives people and at the same time, work as collaboratively as you can in partnership, which is so critical in our sector. So just looking forward, there was a point, I think, when we began to emerge from COVID where we were all very optimistic. We're going to build back better. It's all going to be much nicer now. But I have to say, I, I don't think I can remember the last time I felt quite so worried about what was going on in the world. You know, we have the global food insecurity that uh, we've seen that's um, particularly being driven by the current war in uh, Ukraine and fuel shortages. We're already struggling to get fuel in some of the countries where we work. And obviously the costs have gone up. And then COVID, although it's ebb, it hasn't gone. You know, and we are worried that maybe other variants will still come. And the cost of living increases right across the world. Those costs are driving up both our own salary cost, programme costs, but also the people who support us, the great British public who provides a lot of our funding they're worried about their own cost of living increases. Are they going to go on prioritising giving to a charity? Also, all of this impacts on government budgets. And that happens both in the uh, donor countries, if you like. So you've seen Britain has just cut its development budget. Sweden has just done so. Uh, a number of countries are doing that too. And then, of course, in the countries where we work, there's much less fiscal space for people to prioritise health. And certainly to prioritise eye health within health when they have all these other challenges. 
And then we have the direct impact of conflict. Lightsabers doesn't work in Ukraine, but we work in places like Nigeria, where the conflict's much bigger than it used to be, Mali, which is tricky. And there seems to have been much more security issues in our countries than ever before. So at the moment, as leaders, we're having to manage ongoing fear and uncertainty amongst our staff. They're worried about, well, what will this mean for the income for the organisation? What will it mean for the programmes of people we're trying to serve? And also they're worried about their jobs. They've seen redundancies in other NGOs and that makes them fearful. And we need to make this balance between reassurance and energising them so they deliver, but also being honest with them so that they don't, again, that they don't feel that we're telling them lies. And of course the thing to remember is all of us are still recovering from the pandemic fatigue. All of us went the extra mile. We had loneliness if you were stuck at home alone, or cramped if you were stuck at home with children, or I'm sure in your case, huge numbers of patients. And that went on a long time and people struggled. And they're only just beginning to recover from that fatigue. And now we're looking at a whole nother set of difficulties. So finally, um, just to say what that we're looking at at the moment, we have a strategy that was finalized and agreed with our board, and we are very strong at the moment financially. British public gave us an outpouring of, of uh, funding during COVID. Also, the other places we were, like Italy, Ireland, Sweden, India, lots of money coming there. We also had a huge injection of cash from Mackenzie Scott, who's Jeff Bezos's ex-wife. However, to, whilst today are very financially strong, if I look forward, income is very much under threat. All these external environments, the fact the British government's not funding, and we have a number of very large programmes that will come to an end in the next year or two. And we will, if you like, come to a cliff edge of funding. So the question for us is, how do we take the money that we have at the moment and best deploy it over the next few years? And it's not something that is fully agreed with insight savers. Some people want to spend it very fast, some people want to be more prudent, and the big debate we have is how do we deploy that over the next five years in a time of unbelievable uncertainty. So I'll leave that there, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Raji's going to ask me some questions now. Yes. Would you like to sit or would you like to stand? Yeah, <laughs> now, how would you deal with when you have a team where most of the members of the team are doing okay? They're not exceptional. But you have one member who's exceptional. However, he's not a team player. So he does not get along with everyone. You give him a task, he, he does it perfectly well. But he cannot work with anyone. He fights with everyone. You get rid of him, you're stuck with a team who's OK. But you don't have anyone who's a star who would lead you forward. You keep him, you will lose the harmony within the team. You will achieve lots of things. But you will kill the atmosphere that is within your team. What would you do? It's, it's a very difficult one. We've got a situation a bit like that at the minute. Uh, I think we're trying to do two things. One is take the person and give them a role which doesn't require them to work with the team as much. You give them like a separate project that they can work on with minimal requirement to be part of the team and see if they can then do that. But recognise that you know, they're probably you can't promote someone like that. Um, they desperately wanted to go for a senior management job. But even in the interview, said, well, of course, I won't want to spend and waste any of my time doing management because I'll want to do this other thing. And um, the other, next, the other piece to do is then you have to try and strengthen the other members of the team or bring in another stronger member of the team so that there isn't quite the same stark difference between this difficult person and the sort of mediocre team. So to try and rebalance. But in the end, I think those sort of disruptive people you probably do have to move on if they can't actually work. You know, if you can't find a project that they can reasonably achieve at without upsetting the rest of people. And I did move on a very senior director who was a bit like that, and that took me much too long because I kept agonising. But if I move him on, you know, he's responsible for bringing in all the funding and you know what will happen. And then I realised he was bullying actually quite a number of members of staff, and that didn't have to go. Uh, another. Uh... Uh, another uh, question. Sometimes one of the advantages of some organizations is you have most of the staff that's been there for quite a few years. So 
they are familiar with the place, they are familiar with the business, they have loyalty uh, to the organization they are working in. But then they are resistant to change. How would you manage them? Because A, they've been there for a long time. It's quite hard to get rid of people who are not really very productive in Saudi, exactly the same as in the UK. I understand in the UK it's not easy to find people. Uh, and at the same time, they're willing to do something. They, they, they like the organization, but they're just hard to, to, to manage. What ways, what incentives do you use to try to make them go in the new direction that you want to go? That's Is there certain incentives? Do you give them a time frame and then you say, I'm sorry about them? I mean, that's an interesting question for us. We do have, at the moment, a very long standing team. And um, that's because I think I did a lot of, if you like, clearing out about sort of seven years ago of the people who really were. I mean, I got rid of five senior members of the team. And I know my board members so starts to get very, you know, what's wrong with this woman? You know, she, she, is she awful? Or can't she just not recruit properly? And so now I do have long-standing people. I think, though, I mean, the ones that I uh, get on well with and have promoted love change. And that's part of the key to it. You only should promote people to your senior levels if they are people who are, if you like, restless and looking for new change. And if we're not changing in the organisation, they'll probably want to go somewhere else because they will get bored. And what we've also done is we've got some individuals at the next level below who are quite challenging. And we're not very hierarchical in sight savers. So people who are not, you know, people are, are welcome to challenge me, uh, the senior team, and have ideas. It's not, you know, know your place. And if you have some very keen, younger people coming in at the next level, pushing those directors, then they are less likely to be resistant to change. But one caveat, of course, is these, is I've been there 17 years, and it's possible that I'm one of those people who doesn't realise that she's resistant to change, and those ideas that I dismiss because they're actually just rubbish are really actually very good, so who knows? They're not, because you've shown how much uh, the organisation... Uh, has grown under your leadership, and you are always innovative. So I know you're saying this out of being humble, but it's not true. You are very innovative, and you jump to any new ideas. Are there any comments or questions from the group? I don't want to be the only one asking, uh, Tursan. Uh, thank you so much, Kavali. Uh, uh, my question, do you think we have different style of leadership? And uh, if so, how can we minimize if there's any conflict between this uh, Stats. I'm sure we do. I mean, everybody, um, everybody leads in their own way. I think. Um, I mean, if I look at the, the people that I know, um, you know, there are different leaders in the NGO world. Uh, some who are whose leadership styles I think I respect more than others. I do think you need a high intellect to be a leader because of complicated organisations. So, you know, I think that is something that has to be common. And I think some of those things I mentioned there, you do need to be good at communicating. Um, you need to be able to talk to donors. You need to be able to talk in public. I think that's important for a leader. But on the other hand, people have, some people are more reflective than others. Not everybody is as outgoing. You know, we've probably, you've probably done some of those assessments, like Myers-Briggs, what type you are. And, it, it, you know, there, there are different sorts of leaders around. And within my own organisation, I look at the next um, level that reporting to me, and they have different characteristics. So um, they're different political affiliations. They are some who have been in development all their lives, who kind of um, wear scruffy clothes and sandals and grow long beards and, you know, feel very at home in emergency situations in the field and I have others who wear suits and used to work at Accenture and they're very precise about, about things. So you can have different people but at the end of the day within a team certainly they have to all respect each other and even if they disagree about things they have to understand and accept those different perspectives and yes there are one or two leaders I've met that I'm not understanding how they're managing to to lead, and there are certain characteristics which I think you can't have. You can't have somebody who's a leader who isn't supportive of their people. And if they are like that, I don't think the organisation is likely to do well. 
and in integrity as well. I think it's one of the big issues at the moment in the UK. You've probably seen our Prime Minister struggling a bit. And fundamentally, it's no good them standing up and saying he's made all the right calls and all the right decisions and um, you know, people like him because the thing in question is his integrity. And that, I think, if you, if you don't have that, you won't be able to succeed. The, the eternal repeated question, can you make someone a leader? Or are they born leaders? And then you can basically train them to be better leaders. You can certainly train them to be better leaders. But there are certainly people who don't want to be leaders, and uh, not everybody does. There are quite a lot of people who are quite happy. They have a skill and an expertise that they want to hone, and they want to do that well. But they have no desire, and as one of my guys said, I don't want to sit in the corner office. I don't want to be the person who has to talk to the board, and I don't want to be the person who's out in front putting themselves out there. And I don't want to be the person who ultimately takes all the responsibility. I want to do the thing I'm really good at. Also, we have people who's, for whom uh, work is the thing that they do in order to live the rest of their life. And they want to do it well. But it's a, not the centre and core of their lives. And I mean, you and I would never begin to understand that sort of person. But there are people like that. And that's fine. We need them. We can't have in our organisation everybody who wants to be the CEO, otherwise it won't work. But So I think I'm, I'm kind of hedging that there, there are leader, people who are born not to be leaders, there are some people born desperate to be leaders, and there are some who could be leaders if they were given the right support. But can you take someone whom you see who has not the, the quality of being a leader, he has the knowledge, he has the expertise, but he's never held a leadership position? Can you groom him, push him to be a leader, or if he doesn't have it, he will never be? I think if he if he wants it and he has certain aspects, so some of the things that we talked about there, you can. But there are certain things where you just can't. Um, somebody with no self-confidence at all is very difficult to turn into a leader. Um, you can improve their self-confidence, but if they fundamentally just don't see themselves in that role, it's very difficult. What it certainly is possible to do is to take people with um, the right aptitude but not the right qualifications and make them leaders. Well, the person I'm proudest of actually in Sight Savers is a young woman who is now our head of operations. She manages all of our processes. She's unbelievably highly good at detail and project management. Her highest qualification is a hairdressing qualification. She is one of my best people and she does brilliant presentations. She's done presentations in international conferences, and she now has confidence. It took us a while to get her over her fear that, but I, you know, you all have degrees and, and things. Yeah, so what? I can begin to pass my physics degree now if I try. That's, you know, you have the skill, so you can do that. I used to tell uh, job applicants who come for interviews, <clears throat> I personally don't, you know, I mean, we need a degree because it's a requirement of the hospital and the law. To me, that degree would just get you through the door to the interview. It's then your personality and your achievement and, and, and your skills that will get you the job, not your degree. So I don't, I don't really care what your degree is. And I, and I believe that some people are born with leadership skills. And sometimes they don't even know they have them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I've seen that a number of times. And I mean, one of the things that I've tried to challenge our HR department, they, they get frightened of me sometimes, I said, I don't want to put education requirements on our job application forms. And only for those roles where you absolutely would have to. So, obviously, I wouldn't want somebody um, advising clinical uh, ophthalmologists who didn't have the qualifications. But otherwise, somebody coming to do marketing, somebody coming uh, to work on policy things, I don't really mind. And I would love to encourage people who perhaps picked up their leadership skills and their and their... Um, you know, their experience through that, through actual life, rather than having spent, like I have, a ridiculous number of years in a university. Uh, the ones that I sometimes struggle with have been young people who've done a whole series of degrees and an MBA and then come into the organisation, well, I know everything. You know, I know what it's done because I went to that lecture. Why can't I write the marketing strategy? Why do you want me to do this menial thing? And those are sometimes the hardest. Yeah, I, mean, I always say that academicians are the biggest problem when they're doing programs and, and any plans. And, and they have a world of their own in their head. 
without real uh, practical experience, and that makes it very difficult to implement whatever they put in writing. I have to struggle with a candidate that I thought, and I still think that he has great leadership, and his CV shows great leadership in managing lots of people in very tough conditions, but because his basic degree is not in the line of work that we want him in, I couldn't get him to be in the hospital. Well, no, I could have forced it, but I don't want to force it. Yeah. But we have that short-sightedness where we need, you know, you have if you want to be an administrator in a hospital, you have to have a business degree in mm -hmm. hospital administration or health administration. Mm -hmm. To me, yes, it might help, but a leader does not need a degree. Any other question from the audience? Come on, guys, wake up. Totally. Uh, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, what makes you better leadership leader? Is it only the experience or there's like a special book you start to read it so, it, so you become a better leadership? Also, the second question is about personality. The leader is still human being. Like he, he still he has own personality, own issue. And also this, the dealing with other people, they have their own uh, personality and issues. So how you can like manage dealing with yourself as a leader and dealing with others? Okay, I think for me, the first question, it's been very much about experience and being a leader in different contexts and also experiencing what it's like to be led. I think that's very important. So I remember my first job going in um, as a woman in a part of the oil industry which had some quite difficult men in it and uh, I upset one of them because I taught all the secretaries how to use a database program and we we revolutionised the uh, the centre that I was working in. They were all very happy, and he came and shouted at me and said, "You've upskilled these wretched women. Now they're all going to want pay rises." And that sort of taught me about some of the um, difficulties of dealing with people who who are very rigid in their thinking. But I think as I've gone through more experiences, I've learned how to defend myself in difficult situations. My first day in one of the bigger jobs in the oil industry, one of the men who was in the, the um, group with me had done some analysis that proved that my director was automatically a stupid thing to do, was uh, economically um, sort of wrong, and that it should be closed down and I should be fired immediately. Um, fortunately, he'd made a simple arithmetic mistake on his front page, and I picked it up. He hadn't had the courtesy to share. And I looked at it and I said, well, you know, that's just wrong, isn't it? That first page so I've stood up. There's no point in even reading that. And actually, quite a lot of his arguments made sense, but fortunately, he'd made a silly mistake. So, but that was learning to be quick on your feet and to, and to fight fire with fire. Never show fear when a bully is actually uh, facing you, however you feel inside. And I also learned never cry at work as a woman. If you're going to cry, you have, you know, and I cry when I'm angry, which is inconvenient. I don't cry when I'm... Uh, uh, sad, but do that privately because you cannot show that kind of thing um, in a work environment. So, and then personality, I think one of the really important things as a leader is that you have to have empathy. You have to be able to put yourself in the shoes of that other person, uh, and particularly knowing that person's strengths and weaknesses and preferences. So, you know, I have one brilliant person who works for me who absolutely loathes public speaking. And um, we had a couple of times where he would get so nervous um, and he, he actually broke down in the middle of one of his presentations. And then ever after, he would have, it would almost trigger him and he wouldn't be able to deliver them. So I had to learn to sort of not to put him in that position, even though he was brilliant, until he managed to recover and then gradually ease him back in by doing very low kind of stress level and he's back again okay now. But it's trying to understand them and accept that people have got different personalities and try and get the best out of them that way. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you very much. The Peter Principle says that people get promoted until they leave, they reach their level of incompetence and that it happens all the time so what is your method for avoiding that and 
for detecting when is a person has reached the full competent status and should not be placed in a specific position. Yeah, I, I do like that one. Of course, as CEO, you kind of that, that's it, isn't it? You kind of reach that level of incompetence where there's nowhere further to, to stick you. Uh, I think this comes back to it's a diff it is difficult because you want to stretch people, so you want to see if they can work at a higher uh, level than they've been operating in. So you don't always know whether they're going to be able to do that. And there are times when I've got that wrong. For example, I took somebody who was a country level director, so he was running the whole of his country. He was fabulous at doing that, and he was very ambitious. And I promoted him into a more senior role, but it was one that was looking after a whole bunch of technical functions across the whole organization. But what it meant was he didn't have a geographical area where he was, if you like, king of the castle, which had was how he had thrived. And he floundered. And in the end, he resigned. I didn't get rid of him, but he said, Carol, this just isn't working for me. I, I, I'm just not able to do that. So I think probably I'm not as good as I should be at seeing that. And when you make that mistake, you do sometimes have to sit with that person and either they tell you they're not happy or you have to say, look, we took this risk. And we gave you all the support we could, whether it's training courses, coaching, mentoring, but it's not working. Then, you know, you do have to split. But then on the other hand, I've had some fabulous successes where I've taken people who have been more junior in the organisation given them a top level role. One fairly recently, my fundraising director, who was promoted at the beginning of the pandemic, very difficult to sort of, it's always hard to become the boss of the people you used to be equal to. And to do that, when you can no longer meet them other than on teams, was hard. But she has been spectacular. So that's one where I thought, no, she's still got quite a long way to go before she reaches her level of incompetence. So, of course, above, above me as CEO, there's only the board, so there you are. But when, when, they, when people reach their level, so to speak, of incompetence, uh, does, doesn't that look badly? Or is there a way to scale back and put them again in a position where they are fully competent and thriving without having the negative connotation about that? Sometimes you can. Uh, again, it's a little bit like the question that... Uh, but as he's asked about when you move somebody into a different special project. So sometimes you, it's very hard to move them back to where they were. Putting somebody into a promotion and then demoting them, they will have lost face, they will have lost respect, they will not usually want that actually. Uh, and so that is an extremely difficult thing to do. You can sometimes move them sideways and we have done that and then that's been a good decision because you play to the strengths that you saw in the first place. But sometimes it's actually better for that person to move out of the organisation. And it's why you have to be very careful about promoting from within, I think. You need to be open with that person and think carefully about, is this the right thing to do to promote them? And if it doesn't work out, what will happen? And I actually have had a couple of conversations in those circumstances. You know, what, you know if it doesn't work out, if we look at it again in six months, what do you think we should do? And being really quite open with that person. Because you will have promoted often underneath. So that job that was there, you can't then just get rid of the person that's filled that job. So it's always a bit of a risk for both people when you do that. Thank you. Thank you. Do you think that seniority by itself is an enough reason for someone to be in a leadership position? No. And there are some people, I think, who are brilliant at the specific thing that they do. And so you pay them you know, a lot of money, give them sort of, if you like, seniority. Uh, but you don't make them a leader. Or at least they might lead in their speciality. So we have one or two of those sort of people in our technical functions who really know their piece, um, their area exceptionally well. But you would never have them managing anybody. They just, it just wouldn't work. But that doesn't mean they can't be seen and they can't be well paid, they can't be respected. But they lead in the sense that they lead in that subject matter and their view holds sway over what you would do in that particular program, but they don't manage and lead individuals. A final question before we conclude, I guess we have the subspecialty lecture coming. I see people who raise their hands. Um, Sorry, thank you for the lecture. I actually have two questions. 
the first one as a, a female leader, uh, how would you sound a uh, very affirmative, confident woman without sounding overpowering to the other gender or offending them in a, in a gentle way? Uh, the other question, have you ever uh, felt an imposter syndrome and how did you navigate through that? <laughs> Imposter syndrome, I'm feeling it now. You know, you feel, women, we, we feel this particularly, I think. I mean, how on earth did I get to be here? Um, and you just have to sort of say, well, I am here, and people have put me here, and people, are, you know, you've come to my the lecture. You've asked me questions, therefore you are interested in hearing what I've got to say. And you just have to stop yourself thinking that and just put that to one side, but recognise that we all feel it all of the time. And then I think one thing that helps you as a woman leader, and I hate to say this, but getting older helps you. I think when you're young, you worry uh, about the being, you know, oh, will I come across as, as too aggressive? Um, and, you know, I don't want to offend my male colleagues. When you get older, they tend to look at you a bit differently. And, I, you know, it, it, frankly, if a male colleague's being, being stupid, then they, they, I'll just talk to him and tell him that. And he's more likely to take it from me now as a CEO person. I wasn't able to do that so much when I was young. And then you have to be careful. There are some things, though, that you should do if you're younger to not look subservient. Be very careful about that because people will then treat you as junior and it'll be harder to rise. Some simple things I say to women in the early part of their career, never pour the tea in the meeting. Even if you're the most junior, get somebody else to do it because you'll be seen as the kind of waitress. Never take the notes in the meeting when I'm you're the best junior. people and offer it to them in meetings. <laughs> okay. Um, in an internal meeting. In, in the notes, don't take notes of the meeting for other people. If somebody says, who will take the notes? We women often are terribly obliging. Yes, of course I'll do it. But then you're seen as a secretary. That advice changes when you get more senior because he who takes the minutes of a meeting controls history. So then sometimes I will volunteer to take the minutes because then I'll write what I wanted the decisions to be. But you have to be careful at what point you move from that to that. The other thing that you have to do is challenge people if you feel that you're not being properly respected. I had a boss who the, the board had made some very difficult decisions a while back uh, and I was very unhappy with what they had done. And I actually got quite angry. And I spoke to him and I told him how angry I was. Uh, and he said, now don't you get emotional with me? And I said, I'm not emotional. I'm extremely angry. Because I knew that he would never have used the word emotion about a man being angry, but they would use that about a woman. And so I challenged him. Uh, so you do have to know when to do that. And all I can say to you is it, gets, it does get easier as you get older. Dr. Sosa Noirati has the next lecture and she graciously gave us a few more minutes, so... Um, I really enjoyed your talk, Doctor, and uh, I found it very inspiring. I just have uh, two questions. Do you think your background in physics and chemistry helped you in your current position? And my second question is, I'm pretty sure that you're proud of many achievements that you've accomplished, but what's your proudest achievement? Okay, I think physics and chemistry per se I certainly don't use any of what I learned, but becoming highly numerate and analytical is very useful. So being able to, you know, read a balance sheet, read a spreadsheet, see what matters in a, a set of numbers quickly, um, be able to sort of pull out inconsistencies, that's hugely useful. Uh, and I think sometimes that can be difficult uh, for people who haven't got a good level of maths. And I think the other piece that's been very useful for me was the legal training that I did so I can read a contract and I can see where somebody's trying to put, sort of pull something over on you. Uh, and, they, and they do that, particularly in our world. Oh, she's a charity. I mean, they wouldn't really know anything. We'll be able to get this. Um, that's been helpful. What have I been proudest of? Well, obviously, there was the, the $100 million. And whenever you win a big contract, there's a great boost. But I think the time I got most emotional about how amazing what my team had done was in 2015 when we had the Sustainable Development Goals. And we'd been working with a lot of, of um, organisations of people with disabilities and, and amplifying their voices and encouraging them, you know, particularly women with disabilities who were doubly marginalised. And we had managed to get within the SDGs a number of really important things. So like every single sustainable development goal, you have to disaggregate the data and, and show that you've done it for disabled people as well as overall. 
And then the whole kind of concept around um, the person who's left but most furthest behind should be first. There were loads of references to disability. When we were stood in a, an after party, and there were people giving speeches, including my number two, and all these disabled people came up to me and they were crying, and they said that the world has changed for us, and sight, without sight savers, this would never have happened. And that was one of those emotions that you get, where you think, well, we may have actually changed the world, and I can't believe that my people and my organisation did that. So those, those are the kind of moments that you feel. And then there's the very simple one, which you will see uh, a lot of the time. I still can't get over going into a hospital, uh, meeting a patient, you know, who sees for the first time, particularly in Africa, they may not have seen uh, for many years, and then they, they see their grandchild for the first time. Uh, and that's still, for me, a very emotional moment. And a, a woman who'd had TT surgery came up to me and she said, I have a life now. I'm not in pain anymore. I can sleep now. I'm part of my social circle. I'm not a burden on my family. And, you know, without you, this wouldn't have happened. And thank you. And those moments still, they still get to me, even now. Thank you, Yeah, for your presentation on the plans, and this special uh, uncertain conditions or, for example, cut budget, how do you define your strategic plans and goals? And this is number one. Number two, based on this, your decision will be on horizontal level, or you prefer to work for what vertical chain of decision taking? What you prefer? Okay, I think this, you, you should stick for the two o'clock lecture. I'll talk a lot about our strategy and how we how we formulate our strategy and what it looks like. And you know, we've just been through that process um, involving a range of different stakeholders and. Um, coming up with trying to make the strategy more coherent so that you know we did used to have several strategies which were quite vertical and yes they still are we have an eye health and fractivera uh, uh, education we're trying now to bring those more together and look more uh, coherently also for example in our programs like neglected tropical diseases where historically we might have focused just on distributing drugs and doing surgeries. Now we work much more with the water and sanitation people, with the education people. Behavioural change is very important to us now, which we probably didn't used to think about as much. So you're more cross-cutting, if you like, the more horizontal aspects of the whole approach. But I'll talk a bit more about that, I think, um, at two o'clock. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. It was very informative, very educational for all of us. Thank you all for attending. I will leave you now for the subspecialty lecture. Uh, Dr. Caroline will be again with us at the Grand Rounds today at your class. Thank you.